Hello, I'm Julian from Worldwide Christian Travel and welcome to part two of A Jewish Understanding of the Bible with Joel Weinberg. A synopsis along with more information about Joel, Worldwide Christian Travel and GGC can be found in the description. Please give a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you are enjoying the lectures. Joel, over to you. Okay, hello everybody and I hope most of you saw the first lecture or the first talk because what we'll be doing today will be building on that. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off with trying to understand the actual ways the Bible was read, interpreted, what tools were used, and then the pinnacle, even though it shouldn't be, will be at the, the end where we'll see how Jesus actually used almost all those tools in one of his parables, which I hope will give a slightly diff deeper understanding of that because we will then understand the various tools and the various ways the Bible was used, interpreted, and understood. Now, you ask almost any Jew, and they will be able to quote the famous saying of there are 70 facets or sides of the Torah. In other words, and this is a difficult concept for many Christians to understand, there can be multiple readings and understandings of the same text, and they're all right. They're all legitimate. They're all good. They all can be used, and they all can be a source of understanding. So that's why when they say there's 70 facets, it can be in almost any direction. Now, there's a famous story, which I love telling, which tells a story about two people who have a conflict and they go to the rabbi to have him solve who is right and who is wrong. The rabbi sits in his room with his wife. The first person comes in and gives a full description, gives his side. The rabbi listens closely and at the end says, you're right. The guy leaves, second one comes in. The rabbi hears his whole story, listens closely. At the end of the discussion, the rabbi turns to him and says, you're right. He leaves and the wife, slightly disturbed, talks, to, turns to her husband and says, how could you say he was right and he was right? And the rabbi looks at his wife and says, you're right. Now, it's a, it, it sounds funny, but everybody can be right, even though we have different explanations. And we'll see how that works soon. We're told of... A rabbi known, known Ben, Ben is son of Bagbag, which is a strange name. And he tells of what, how we derive our information. And he says, turn it over, i.e. the Torah, and again turn it over for all is there. It is an unlimited, never-ending source of knowledge, information, and new knowledge. And look into it and become gray and old therein and do not move away from it for you have no better portion than it. From learning the Bible over and over, you will always discover new things. There is, there is no limit to the knowledge that can, comes from it. Second important point we're going to deal with is many people will concentrate solely and say the only way to read the Bible is, to, is a literal interpretation of the Bible. I read the text, I understood what it says, not looking for games or things that were played there. But to my opinion, that can't work. Two examples. In Psalms 19, we read, the heavens declare the glory of, the God, of God and the skies proclaim his handwork. Now, if we read it literally, the heavens are speaking and declaring God's glory. Now, it's much easier to say, okay, we see the heavens, we see the beauty, we see the wonderful elements of the world. There's a wonderful Jewish tradition that you wake up in the morning, you open your window, you look out, and you say, how great are your creations, O Lord. And we appreciate God's creation from scratch every morning. You can do it throughout the day. But literally, of course, the heavens do not declare, unless I have a problem in interpreting or understanding thunder. Nehemiah takes it a stage a little farther, maybe. He says, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, the highest heavens, and all their hosts. 
the earth and everything on it, the seas and everything in them. You keep them alive, and the host of heaven prostrate themselves to you, but they don't. Well, heaven will bow down to God. They, <laughs> so well, again, we need to read into that. It's very simple, but again, we, the reading into text sometimes will go much, much farther, and then we'll see that Jesus actually did the same thing himself. Now, the traditional four basic elements of how we read the Bible is what this picture is. It's an orchard. And we are told there are 70 faces to the Torah. Now, if we look over here, we'll be able to see that there are four basic ways that the Torah is, or that the Bible is interpreted. Pshat, that's the basic literal understanding of the text. You read it, and that's pshat means simple. Remez is an allegorical meaning of the text. Drash is an, it's an interpretive reading into the text, and so it is using really a mystical reading. Drash, interpretive, so it is a secret. The four of them together will spell pardes, which is a very interesting word because it's originally a Persian word. The English use of the word pardes is what you know today as paradise. That's where the word comes from. And you can see the first letter of pshat, remez, drash, sod, pardes. In Hebrew, pardes means an orchard. But in reality, it's interpreted, and we're not going to go into it now, almost as the orchard or the trees of the Garden of Eden. So there we have the link, paradise, pardes. So the four ways to read it, the simple, plain, the allegorical, the interpretive or imperative sense, and so the mystical side of it. Here, once again, we see what the Torah looks like. We're going to deal with that, even how that can be used as an interpretive. Now, who has the right? In reality, we're told that any interpretation given by a scholarly person is as if it was given to Moses in Sinai. But in the book of Deuteronomy itself, we're told, who do you turn to if you have an issue? And we have to keep in mind, this is a Deuteronomical text. Jerusalem is the pinnacle and is the center, and it says, and if there arise a matter too hard for thee to, in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, even matters of controversy within thy gates, then shall thou arise and get thee up unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt come unto the priests and the Levites and unto the judge that shall be in those days. So here we have Levites, because in the Jewish tradition, the Levites especially, the priests are also from the tribe of Levi. The Levites were the teachers and unto the judge. In other words, the judges do not have to be from the tribe of Levi, but they have to be knowledgeable people that shall be in those days. And thou shall inquire, and they shall declare unto thee the sentence of the judgment. So this is talking about major legal, legal elements, but also explanations and interpretations. And thou shalt do according to the tenor of the sentence which they shall declare unto thee from the place which the Lord shall choose. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they shall teach thee, according to the law which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee. Thou shalt do, thou shalt not turn aside from the sentence which they shall declare unto thee to the right hand or to the left hand. You have to follow. There's no, not much leeway there. Now, Shemot Rabbah, medieval interpretation, but uh, 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 multiple understandings of every verse, in this case in Shemot, in other words, in Exodus, but based on much, much, much earlier 
cases in this type, in this case, Rabbi Abahu, which is a, who was a third century Jewish scholar, and he says, and he gave it to Moses, in other words, to Torah, the five books of Moses, and it says, Rabbi Abahu said, all the 40 days that Moses spent above, in other words, on Mount Sinai, he would learn Torah and forget it. He said to him, master of the world, I have, I have 40 days and I do not know a thing. What did the Holy One, blessed be he, do? He finished the 40 days and the Holy One, blessed be he, gave it to him as a gift. In other words, what we understand from here is what, what the rabbi is saying that maybe at the beginning God wanted Moses to memorize the whole Torah. But he gave it to him as a gift, as is stated in the verse, and he gave it to Moses, physically gave it to him. And did Moses learn the entire Torah? It is written about the Torah. And again, once again, we find words or messages that is from other sources, and you link them up, something that Jesus would do all the time. It is longer than the earth in size and wider than the sea. It's so immense. And in 40 days, Moses learned it, but rather the Holy One, blessed be he, taught it to Moses in its general principles, Kalim. He gave him the basic element. And this is the meaning when he finished. At the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, it says, Vahi kichaloto, at the very end. Kichaloto means he concluded, he finished speaking with him. It was kichaloto, klalim, you see the play on words, he gave him kelim, kechaloto, sound similar, maybe they both have the meaning. So he was given the basic element, and Moses was to, and throughout all the ages, you are to learn from that, from those basic tools and understandings and ways of learning, you get a deeper understanding of it all the time. The Torah and the holiness. Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, we start and it says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. A commandment to the Jewish people, to the children of Israel, you must be holy. Now, most of us will, if we read it just regularly, we'll try to understand what holy is, holy can be special, holy can be morally better, holy can be that is more religious, more special, more pure. The rabbis gave an interesting explanation, and they said, shall be holy, kudoshim tihiyu. This means keep aloof from the forbidden sexual relations just mentioned and from sinful thoughts. In other words, you have to keep yourself on a sexual moral level separated. But where did that come from? Now, if we read the chapter before, that's why they say just mentioned, it talks about the elements of what, what you're forbidden to do. And then, it, then, then the rabbis continue and say, it is evident that this is the meaning of Kedoshim to you because wherever you find in the Torah a command to fence yourself, remember, separate, build a fence around you. We talked about that with Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. You build a fence, and Jesus actually talks about the, the sexual, moral fences you build to protect yourself, to separate yourself. The, not coincidental. In against such relations, you find a mention of holiness. In other words, the term of holiness is usually connected to abstaining or removing yourself from various sexual behaviors you should not take upon yourselves. Examples are, and we're told about the priests, who they may marry and who they may not marry. They shall not take a wife that is a harlot or a profane and a divorced woman. There's a whole list of which women they're not allowed to marry. And the next verse says, for I, the Lord who sanctifieth you, am holy. Just like I am holy, you will be holy. How do you become holy? from abstaining from your removing yourself from these relations. Just a very interesting little element, uh, element. The term harlot, which also will come across it 
with the story of Judah and Tamar, when he's looking for her to make the payment, and he turns to and says, where is that harlot? The term that is used there and here is Kdesha. Now, holy Kadosh, Kdesha, the same root. So in this case, we have the Bible uses the same source of the word to represent two opposite elements. Again, it will be totally lost in the translation, but Kadesha is a harlot, Kadosh is holy. And they continue, neither shall he profane his seed by the forbidden unions of the marriages, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. I make him holy, I make him sanctified by removing him. So the understanding, the interpretation, it's not the Simple reading. If you would just be reading this on your own, that would not be the conclusion you came to. And there can be many explanations. They shall be holy, and they were told, followed, they shall not take a wife that is a harlot or a profane. That's what Vaikra Rabbah tells us. So the text is read into based on what it has around it and the finding the same word that can match the explanation in many places. Just two important elements we have to remember. When they talk about, in the Jewish tradition, they talk about receiving the Torah, they're always talking about the written Torah and the oral Torah. So it is today amongst the Jewish tradition, except there is a group called the Karaites, who we will, similar to, to the Sadducees, we'll, even though there's no relationship between them, and we'll talk about the Sadducees, we'll mention that in a minute. And last but not least, the huge mistake, Paul always talks about the Torah, the five books of Moses, the commandments, as law. It is not just law, it is teachings, it is instructions. And we'll see literally how the Bible uses that same term for learning, teaching, and following, because yora, yore, teaching, Torah, and in Hebrew, a teacher is more, they all come from the same source, because the Torah deals to a great extent with moral issues, not just with legal. Now, to understand the groups that exist in the time of Jesus and their understanding of, and their, the way they would interpret and understand the Bible. We're, to, we're starting at around the time of the Hasmoneans, first, second century, 167, defeating the Greeks, or the Hellenists really to be accurate, and the groups that existed, the Essians. Also, I'm mentioning the Yachad because those are groups similar to the Essians that lived in Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They were, their leadership were priests. They believed in a very spiritual understanding of the Bible and with a huge emphasis on purity. As an example, they would take a pure, uh, they, they would take a ritual bath twice a day to stay pure. We'll talk a bit about baptism in the future or in the, in the, in the coming minutes. They put a huge emphasis on the end, on the they, and the end of times in the world to come, they, taught, they saw themselves as the children of light versus everybody else were children of darkness. And at the end, there would be a war between the children of light and the children of darkness. Some of you that have read Mormon texts might see a similarity, even though there's no relationship whatsoever. With that said, John the Baptist's behaviorisms would be very similar in many elements to the Essians, a very simple life, basic meals, removing yourself from society, and sharing the idea of the world to come. And they, would, they, they saw a city of, of a spiritual Jerusalem versus the physical Jerusalem that from their perspective had become impure and spiritually destroyed. That's very similar to St. Augustine, and there there actually can be some similarity we can find. The Sadducees, their name comes from the word Tzadok, the high priest, that they thought that the leadership should be descendants of the family of Tzadok, the high priest. They believed only in the basic, almost literary understanding of the Torah or of the Jewish tradition or Jewish law. They and they, as being priests, felt that they had the right to understand it and interpret it, and they alone. They did not believe in a world to come. They did not believe in an afterlife. And that's why 
Jesus rarely relates to them. We'll see a couple of examples where he does relate to them because he had nothing in common with them. One, he wasn't a priest. His disciples weren't priests. We only come across him relating to them when he's in Jerusalem because that's where they were stationed. So he has very little relationship with them when he's in Jerusalem. They challenge him. You might remember the story of the, of the woman who married seven brothers. And then they ask, who will rise with her? Again, challenging him in a way, but because from their perspective, there was no afterlife. The Pharisees were the largest of the theological philosophical groups that existed in Judaism in those days. Again, are the estimates of the rabbis or of the scholars or of the historians today, there are around 6,000 Pharisees because they were in a way the rabbis of the day. And they were in many, many ways, and we'll see literally that Luke says the same thing. They were very similar to Jesus in many elements theologically, and their center of study was in Sephrius. We've mentioned Sephrius or Tzipori many times, which was four kilometers away from Jesus, home in Nazareth. So the connection and the link was there. They interpreted the Torah. They read into the text. They put a huge emphasis on the oral tradition, as did Jesus. But the big difference was that they also, the, they were started or influenced by the leadership or generations after the leadership who came back from Babylonia after the destruction of the temple in 586. And they brought back traditions as we spoke about with what did Jesus eat with the element of the washing of the hands. A tradition, Jesus said, that's not part of the Torah for sure, but it's also not part of the oral law that I know. This is a tradition that you say is the teachings of the fathers that is not part of my teachings. They believed in the world to come. They believed in the afterlife. So they, the discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees was on the interpretation, the reading of the text, and the understanding of the text, but within almost the same core. That's why I'm mentioning the Galileans, that Jesus was part of, almost all of his disciples were part of. Similar to the Pharisees, but unlike the Pharisees, when the temple was destroyed, the Galilean Jews stayed there. So they preserved the tradition that existed before the destruction of the temple and were not willing to accept the interpretations or the traditions brought back when the Jews returned from Babylonia. The Samaritans. The Samaritans are not Jews. Though what happened was in 722 BC, the Syrians destroyed the kingdom of Israel, the 10 tribes, and took them into the, uh, an internal, we could almost say, exile. We don't know where they went. Those are what are known as the 10 lost tribes. And in order not to see, leave the land empty, they would bring in an, a different people they had captured. Now, the tradition in those days, when you come to a new country, the God is a geographical God. He's the God of a location. The God that existed there was the God of Israel. His book was the Torah. So the Samaritans accept only the Torah, the five books of Moses, but have rewritten it. So there are around six to 700 changes that they put into the Torah, the, most of them concentrating on the element that not Jerusalem is the center of the belief, but Mount Gerizim in Shechem. That's why when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman, in Shechem, because that's next to Mount Grizim, where their headquarters is. We don't know where the Samaritans come from. I would like to one day maybe get a DNA test to be able to trace back where they came from. If any of you are ever in Israel <laughs> during the Passover celebration, you must go see the Samaritan, the, the Samaritan Passover. And I, as a vegetarian, <laughs> Don't find it <laughs> that pleasant seeing all the sacrificing of the lambs, but you will really see the sacrifices as they were in the time of the temple with all of the ceremonies. You can get a very clear understanding of what things were like in Jesus' days in the temple. Just they have the high priest, they have the priest, they have the, the, each family sacrificing it. There are only a couple of maybe 300 Samaritans left, so it's on a much smaller level than would have been the temple, you get the real physical feeling. Now, math, some examples. Matthew 22, the same day Sadducees came to him saying, 
there is no resurrection. So we're told by Matthew, the huge difference, the Sadducees not believing in resurrection. In Acts, Luke tells us the clear difference between the Sadducees that we have nothing in common with and the Pharisees that we have a joint talking table. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angel or spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all three. That said, Matthew has an issue on the, the way they interpret the baptism. The baptism in Judaism has little to do with what baptism in Christianity is today, even though the baptismal tradition in Christianity, which in most denominations is a one-time thing and taken from Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River, but Jesus would have baptized himself or purified himself many more times as all Jews would do. The baptism is the spiritual, if you are spiritually unclean, and again, spiritually unclean, that is if you touched a dead body. If a woman, at the end of a woman's menstrual cycle, she will baptize herself, or really purify herself in living water, as it's said in the Bible. And he challenges them of going to purify yourselves because again, as I always tell groups I work with, when you go down to the baptismal site in the Jordan River, the water there is very far from clean at the original baptism site, not the site in the northern part of it. And there you can understand you can be spiritually clean and physically filthy. You can be physically filthy. You can be physically clean, but spiritually filthy. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. But when he saw some, so many Pharisees and Sadducees going down to be baptized, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee with, from the wrath to come. Again, also taking a little poke at the Sadducees who, don't, who can't deal with the wrath to come because they don't believe in it. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. You have to be spiritually clean, not just purifying yourselves. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. In other words, the, Jesus is telling them the world to come is not based on your genealogy. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. We, told, we mentioned this last week. Here's a play on words. Min ha'avanim yakumu banim. Avanim banim. Same root, not really same root, but same pronunciation. And there people say, "How? Huh, why is the interesting rhyme? There's an extra message that comes from here. Now, the destruction of the temple was a, one of the most traumatic issues, uh, the events that happened to the Jewish people ever. And it also changed the whole reading and understanding of the Bible or of the way things were handled, to put it more accurately. The destruction of the temple, the Sadducees lost the base of their power. They were priests. They based their power on the temple and the sacrifices. That came to an end, and with them, the Sadducees disappeared. The rabbis replaced the priests and the kings, both as the political leadership and as the religious leadership. A new position, the patriarch, who was known as the Nasi, Nasi is a term that's used in Hebrew today, to talk about a president, replaced it. So there was a new leader, and he was a religious leader. The high court, we, we, tell, we come across the Sanhedrin with Jesus' trial at the end of his life. There were 70 or 71 people, and that became the senior legal and interpretive institution. The Sanhedrin, we'll see what happened with the Sanhedrin in a minute. Prayer replaces sacrifices in Judaism and in the early Jesus movement. Because keep in mind, the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem after his death were still observant Jews. Peter, James, the disciples, all preserved, were, good, were told in Acts of their going to the temple. They, but once the temple was destroyed, prayer replaced the sacrifices for the Jews and prayer replaced the sacrifices for the Jesus movement. So 
the, the evolution and the development of prayer played a major part. Now, how could the rabbis legitimize the having the prayer replace the sacrifices? So then they turn to Hosea and it says 14.2. In some sources, it's 14.3. We're not going to get into the reason for the mix-up of the verses. It says in Hebrew, now, the English says, take words with you and return to the Lord. In other words, and they're talking about the individual, each individual, there's not communal prayer, but similar to Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer, he's saying, but he says, say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously. And it's also interesting, the plural, like the Lord's Prayer, even though that, again, was to be said by as an individual. Now, here's the terrible element of the problem with mistranslations, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. The Hebrew says, offer our lips as sacrifices of bulls. In other words, our lips, our words, instead of the bulls, instead of the physical sacrifices. Now, did Hosea say that the sacrifices should be ended? Ending? No. But he reads into the rabbis, read into the text that the words that you use will fill in, will replace the bulls, will replace the sacrifices. And based on this, the rabbis came to interpret this verse, which was not the original meaning of the verse, but that the prayers can replace the sacrifices. And once again, how you read into the text and you get new understandings and new meanings. Uh, one of the great Jewish scholars of the 20th century, a philosopher, a theologian, leader, and also civil rights leader in the 1960s, his most famous picture is walking hand in hand with Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement, says Judaism is based on a minimum of revelation, the basis, the, the Torah, the the oral, the oral writings, and a maximum of interpretation. The 2,000 years of reading into the text, understanding the text, interpreting the text is the basis, and that existed even in the time of Jesus, as we will see in a minute. The Mishnah, which was the codification of the oral law, had four stages. The whole discussions, the oral law, as it was discussed, read, interpreted in the Second Temple period, after the Second Temple period, it moved to Yavne, which is also where the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Court, because that was the center of the reading and understanding. Then it moved to Usha. Then it moved to, surprise, surprise, Sipori, right near Nazareth and also in Beit Sharim, where the person, Rabbi Yudasi, that patriarch, this, the, the rabbi known as Rabbi Judah, the prince, wrote down and documented the oral law. Then we have the Tosefta, which was in Palestine, the Jew, which is an addition, Tosefet addition to the Mishnah, sources that did not make it into the Mishnah. The Jerusalem Talmud, which is an understanding and digging into the Mishnahic discussions, which the Jerusalem Talmud, of course, was written in Tiberias. Don't look for logic, but it's known as the Jerusalem Talmud, mainly in Hebrew. The Babylonian Talmud, which was written in Babylonia in Aramaic, one third of the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, is discussions, learning, reading into the text, not dealing with law per se. This is what a page of the Talmud looks like. Here you have the Mishnaic text, which is in Hebrew, quoting the original oral law. Here you have a discussion about it. And all around here you have interpretations and explanations and understanding into it. That's what the the Talmud would look like, just to give you guys a general idea. Now, the interpreting of the Bible. Here's an example, and again, <laughs> quite interesting, and we're going to go, as we go down, we're going to deteriorate with de more complex and even more controversial readings, and again, always remember, not every rabbi accepts every interpretation, and that's the difference between them. That's why the Talmud, you have never-ending discussions. All opinions are kept there, even if they weren't accepted, because the process is no less important than the final result. 
10th century Seder Eli, uh, Eliyahu Zuta, but tells a story you could almost see Jesus telling. Once I was walking in on the way and a man found me and approached me in a heretical way. He said to me, the Torah was given on Sinai, not the Mishnah. Again, the period this is written was probably what was known as a character who does not accept the oral law, i.e. the Mishnah. By what a parable can we answer him? And then he says, a mortal king who had two servants whom he loved with utter love. Now, as I read this, <laughs> a few parables will jump into your, into your minds. To one he gave a measure of wheat, and to the other he gave a measure of wheat. To one a bundle of flax, to the other a bundle of flax. What did the clever one of the two do? He took the flax and wove it into a tablecloth. He took the wheat and made it into fine flour by sifting the grain first and grinding it. Then he kneaded the dough and baked it, set the loaf upon the table, spread the tablecloth over it, and kept it to await the coming of the king. But the foolish one of the two didn't, did nothing at all. After a while, the king came into his house and said to the two servants, my sons, bring me what I gave you. One brought out a table with a, the loaf baked a fine flour on it with the tablecloth spread over it. Now, just a small comment, it says he brought a table because in the times of Jesus, you would, each person would have their own table. You would sit on the floor. So unfortunately, the historical, well, not the historical, but the most famous depiction of the Last Supper with Michelangelo, with everybody sitting on one side of the table is wrong. First of all, again, Mel Brooks had a wonderful interpretation why everybody was sitting on one side of the table so the artist could draw a picture of them, like taking a picture today. In reality, everybody was sitting on the floor with their own personal table ahead of them in pillows so they could lie down like in a symposium, like a free man. Well, that's just a side comment. And the other brought out his wheat in a basket with a bundle of flax over the wheat grains. What a shame, what a disgrace. Need it be asked which of the servants was more beloved? He, of course, who laid out the table with the loaf baked, the fine flour upon it. And in other words, it's quite clear, the truth is the Holy One gave the Torah to Israel. This is the wheat and the flax. He gave it to them as wheat out of which the fine flour of the Mishnah was to be produced. You take the basis and basics and then you make, you work it, you develop it, you understand it, you deepen it, and that is the final production through the ways of reading and interpreting the, the Midrash, also known as Exegesis. We talked about that, yes, last week. The Midrash, the written down Midrash was written down between the fifth and 12th century. The Targum interpreter, which is a translation, was from the third to the eighth, but again, a large part of that came from much earlier periods. The Midrash is answering problems, contradictions, special words, grammar, almost anything we come across in the Bible. There is a Midrash Halacha and Midrash Agada. Midrash Halacha, which we will see soon as we will see the Midrash Halacha Agada. Midrash Halacha is, again, interpreting, reading into the texts, interpreting and giving meanings and stories, but the, the, final, the final product we get will teach us how we are to behave on a legal basis. Halakha is the legal element. The Midrash Agada are interpretations, parables, reading into the text that teach us how to live our life, not from a, or lessons we should learn, not from a legal level, but from a moral general level. The Midrash expounds upon the deeper meaning of the verse, not the literary meaning in any way means or as an example, the Hebrew word in the beginning, the first word in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis, the Torah begins, the Bible begins, bereshit, in the beginning. The Midrash tells us that this word can be split into two words, bereshit, b, inside, reshit, the first 
what are the first? So what were the into what was the world created into or what was part of the creation of the world? the Jews and the Torah. So the idea was that the Torah, the five books of Moses, were created together with the Jewish people with the very beginning of creation, because that, of course, does not appear in the story. And people, the Jews or other people do not have to accept that, but that's an interpretation that is read into it. Although this is not the simple interpretation of the word, nevertheless, it is a true and valid way of understanding the Torah, because as we said, there can be multiple truths. There's not a single truth. Now, how does it work? Let's, the basis of the right to read and understand and interpret the Torah comes from Deuteronomy 17. You must act according to decisions they, in other words, spiritual leadership, give you at the place the Lord will choose, of course, Deuteronomical, be careful to do everything they say. Vasita kechol asher yorucha. Yoru, once again, they shall teach you. In other words, the rabbis, and in, in, in reality, everybody has the right to learn and to teach and to interpret as long as you stay within certain limitation. The Torah given and received, both sides play a part. In other words, there's an ongoing revelation. The revelation is the person's ability to understand. It's a, it's, it's a God given, it's a divine revelation that, not, that, that is a continuing element that thanks to that, people can interpret it. Interpretation making what is implicit explicit. The purpose of the Midrash, Midrash answers problems, contradictions, special words, and grammar. Let's see, and really anything. Let's see a few examples. More is hidden in the Bible than meets the eye. Let's see how, first, a Jewish explanation, then let's see also how the same thing was done by early Christianity. Genesis 3.3 says, and Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him when he saw meeting his brother, Jacob, and fell on his neck and kissed him. Simple thing, they met two brothers, they suddenly love each other, but the rabbis had an issue, because again, we're not gonna get into the whole conflict. Were they brother, were they good friends in one place in the, in the Bible we come across that there's a, that Esau will always hate Jacob. And the rabbis had an issue with that. There are other rabbis, of course, they buried their father together. So maybe they did have good relations. The understanding of the text, it was good, but some of the rabbis had an issue with it. And a very strange, the word of kissing, it says, Vayishakehu. And then they said, well, really, don't read the word Vayishakehu, read the word Vayinshakehu. In other words, he bit him. And then the weeping comes alongside that. So they read into the text, to give a totally different meaning of the story. Early Jesus movement. We read the wonderful, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, to my opinion, where in Isaiah 52, it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, of good that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Isaiah's teaching, and again, terrible translation, but I'm using the King James on both the verses we're dealing with, because in the book of Romans, Paul says, shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written. He's quoting Isaiah, and he should be, we should have an exact quotation of the verse, and Paul knew it. Now, again, keep in mind that here Paul was using a Greek translation. He was using the Septuagint, but how beautiful are the feet of them that again, here we have publisheth peace and preach the gospel of peace. So the publishing is done, the gospel, again, Paul did not have the, the gospels in front of him, and bring glad tidings of good things. What happened to the publisheth of salvation? Now, if we look back, we will suddenly see that salvation, the good news, mashmiya yeshua, 
Jesus' name, Yeshua. He took it for granted and read it into the text. The publisheth salvation is Jesus. That's not what the text says in any way, means, or form. But Paul is using the typical Jewish way of interpreting the text to take this and say, aha, whose feet? Who's bringing good tidings? The public, the salvation, i.e. Jesus. And that's how the text is read into a typical Jewish reading of the text, playing with the text and coming to a conclusion that he's talking about Jesus. Now, other basic elements are the assumptions. Bible is a fundamentally relevant text, not a history. It's not a history book. It doesn't have footnotes. It's not a history of the past, but written for the relevance of future generations. The Torah is given for the Bible is given for all generations, and it can be read and understood and interpreted for all generations. There's a famous Jewish saying that Maaseh Avot, the deeds or the ways of the father, are a siman, are a sign for the sons. The Bible is perfect and perfectly harmonious. If anything that looks like a mistake needs interpretation and understanding, because there can't be mistakes, nothing in the vain, nothing in vain, every word has a meaning. And the Bible is divinely inspired. Now, the reading into the text, or needing to rewrite the text almost, or to have stories that will help us understand the text, and here's a case that it looks like we have a problem or a contradiction in the Bible. In the book of Exodus 1515, we're told about the Egyptian army, and it says, the deeps covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. The Egyptians sank into the sea. So they worded the chariots and everything. They ran down, wound up at the bottom of the sea. But one chapter before, we're told, thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians where, not at the bottom of the sea, they literally physically saw them dead upon the seashore. A first, second BCE book called The Wisdom of Solomon, which is, has been preserved by some of the churches, not in the Jewish Bible, but a Jewish text written in Greek, written in Alexandria in Egypt rewrote the story in a way, because they saw this and they say, wait a minute, we have a contradiction. There can't be a contradiction. How do we rewrite the story? She brought them over the Red Sea. Again, interesting enough, talking about God as a female, but that's a whole different theological discussion. Over, she brought them over the Red Sea and led them through deep waters. But she drowned their enemies and cast them from the depth of the sea. So here you have an attempt, both sinking at the bottom of the seas and drowning on the shores. Here's a, an attempt to rewrite or interpret the text to help us re have a new story. To, to be honest, you'll see that an awful lot in the early church and much later also trying to deal with, let's say, when was Jesus crucified? Was it according to John? Before the Passover, the day before, or according to the Synoptic Gospels. And some people will rewrite the story to make all stories come together. Now, here we can see the last chapter of the book of Isaiah as it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what I want to point out is this word over here, because it's not between the lines. What it is, as the copier of the scroll saw, thought that the text was wrong. Maybe a word fell out, and he added it here. Mikol, just a side comment. B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, written over here. But Mikol, so he's saying the text is somebody might have forgotten or to help you in the future understand it. Amazingly enough, here we have this verse, and it says, Have you et kol achichem mikol? He was right. That should have been in the text. In other texts that might have been copied and led to our the, 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 the Masoric, the, the, the Bible as we have it today, the book of Isaiah, it made it into it. Same thing in the English and in the Greek and in the land, all nations. A word was left out here 
or added and to help us understand that the Lord out of not just nations, but all nations. So here we have somebody interpreting or correcting and that stayed forever. Another interesting, it's more of a almost artistic interpretation is here we have the song, the song of Moses as the children of Israel, after the children of Israel left. So it's written in a poetic writing, unlike the traditional writing of the Torah. And when we come to the very end, we're told about Vayashov Adonai Elohemet Mehayam, that God brought the water on them. And it says, Uvne Israel the children of Israel walked in the dry area, Betochayam, inside the sea. Now, when the children of Israel left Egypt, we're told, The sea is a wall to them from the right and from the left. So the tradition became that the way that the, this story is written, Hayam, which is written here, and Hayam, which is written here, the sea, Hayam is the sea, is a wall with the children of Israel walking between us. Here we literally have a graphical interpretation of the Bible, seeing the sea on either side and the children of Israel in the middle. How do we deal with textual problems? So let's see if you take one story and use it to understand multiple issues that can be dealt with. And Cain spoke unto Abel, his brother. What did they speak? It says they spoke. We don't know their conversation. So the rabbis wanted to see what could have been their conversation that would have led to such a deed. Genesis, Rabbah, and Cain spoke unto Abel, his brother, about what did they quarrel? Come, said they. And so one of the rabbis said, this is what they said, let us divide the world. One took the land and the other took the movables. And we can, each of which made a better financial decision. The former said, the land you stand on is mine. While the latter retorted, what you are wearing is mine. One said, Stripped, the other retorted, fly off the ground. Out of this quarrel, Cain rose up against his brother Abel. Rabbi Joshua of Siknin said in Rabbi Levi's name, both took the land and both took the movables. But what did they quarrel? One said, the temple must be built in my area, while the other claimed it must be built in mine. In other words, in the idea of the temple already existed with creation, similar to what we read about the Torah being created with the word. For thus it is written, now they're going to use a text to justify this claim. And it came to, play, it came to pass when they were in the field. Where did we come from? Field? Now, field refers to naught but the temple. As you read in the book of Micah about Zion, in other words, Zion is not Mount Zion as we know today, but the location of the temple shall be plowed as a field. Here we're talking about a field. Here we're talking about a field. So we're talking about the temple there. We're talking about the temple there. Out of this argument, Cain rose up against his brother Abel. Rabbi Judah ben Rebbe, it's not Rabbi, but Rebbe in this case, there was somebody's name, it was the name that somebody was known as, then about what was their quarrel, said Rabbi Huna, an additional twin was born with Abel. That doesn't appear in the text, but here they're answering an additional problem we have with the text, because who could Cain have married? Who could have Abel have married? If there were no women with the creation, so, ah, there was another claim, and they each claimed her. Because originally it says the quarrel was about Eve, but the Eve had already died. So it's a different Eve, and that was Abel's twin. The one claimed, I will have her because I am the firstborn, while the other maintained, I must have her because she was born with me. So it was an argument. So <laughs> the first killing of two brothers was over a woman. But now, but why are they having this whole huge discussion? Because there's another problem with the text. And it's a theological problem. Wonderful picture painted by Mark Chagall. We read in the conflict that they have, 
And in the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruits of the ground an offering to the Lord, and Abel, he also brought the firstlings and the flock and of the fat thereof. And God, and, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offerings. Now, what they're doing here, they're in a way <laughs> giving God clemency or granting him a, 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 a free pass, because according to this story, the murder took place because of God favoring one of the two. So we have to have a different reason for the, for the fight. So that's an additional question they came to answer and came up with these stories to solve that theological element. Because was God arbitrary? A question that we would not ask ourselves, but again, in the Jewish tradition, all questions are legitimate. Sometimes answers are more problematic. And then we continue to read into the text, to play with the text, to try to find new messages from the text. God said to him, where is your brother Abel? What's wrong with that question? Of course God knew where Abel was. So what is this whole discussion once again? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? But then they add on to the dialogue that's going on. And we were told that Cain is saying to God, you are the one who watches over all beings. And you ask this of me? And then they bring a parable to help us understand this. This can be compared to a thief who stole tools at night and was not caught. In the morning, the keeper caught him and said to him, why did you steal tools? The thief replied, I stole, I, I'm, I wasn't, I'm, I'm no saint, but I did not neglect my job. It's you who are responsible for the stealing of the tools. But you whose job it was to keep the gate, why did you neglect your job? And now you speak to me so? Similarly, Cain said to God, yes, I killed him. But you created the evil inclination in me. You are the keeper of all, and still you let me kill him. For had you accepted my sacrifice over here, as you accepted his, I would not have been jealous of him. An amazing, very <laughs> controversial text, but it's a legitimate discussion. You can accept it, you cannot accept it. We need to read into the text and see, are we responsible, are we not? Of course, we are. Rab Shimon Bar Yochai, first century and the great Jewish scholars, said, it is difficult to say this thing, and the mouth cannot utter it plainly. Now, here's an example. Think of two athletes wrestling before the king. Had the king wished, he could have separated them, but he did not so desire. And one overcame the other and killed him. He, the victim, cried out before he died, let my cause be pleaded before the king. Even so, the voice of thy brother, and this is what we're told, cries out against me. Now, the text you all remember is cries out to me. Called me elai minadama elai, but in reality, he says, Maybe you want to read it, Sokim, Alai, ah, against me from the, so again, interpreting a word, reading into the text. The linguistic element and the need to interpret. And we'll continue again, taking the story to see how many different ways we can read into the story, read into the text, and come to multiple conclusions. Sometimes they'll be even contradicting. Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I don't know, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother crieth unto me from the ground. Again, so Akim elai min adama. But there's another problem. We have the word here, dmei. Now in Hebrew, water and blood are singular and plural. The word water, doesn't have a plural element. Blood doesn't have a plural, but here the blood, it really should be the bloods of your brother called to me from the ground. And then why is that word unlike a typical word? Rabbi Juden said, it is not written 
thy brother's blood sing, thy brother's bloods, i.e., his blood and the blood of all of his descendants. Now, just to add on to this, <laughs> those of you who saw Schindler's lists, they saw the famous Talmudic interpretation at the very end, he who saveth one life is as if he saved the whole universe, because it's all those generations. Abel being killed, it wasn't just he, it was the bloods, all of his descendants, and then if he wouldn't have been killed, population of the world would have been twice what it is today. That's good or bad is a different discussion. But that's, you read into, you try to understand why is it plural. Rab Huna observed a different way we can understand it. It is not written, surely I have seen yesterday the dam of Navot. Again, we're talking about, they quote the story of, of Navot and the blood dam of his sons. But surely I have seen yesterday the bloods of Navot, because the term blood in plural also appears to the, in the story with Navot or Naboth, and the bloods of his sons. Here we have the Bible interpreting when it says bloods, it's not just one generation, it's multiple generations. If that's the meaning there, that's the meaning here, which means his blood and the blood of his descendants. The rabbi said it is not written his own servant conspired against him for the blood, dam of the sons of Yehoiada, Jehoiada, but again it says the bloods of the sons of Yehoiada, Jehoiada, and when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases. His own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest, so with him being killed, the rest were killed, and they buried him in the city of David. The, the, but they buried him not in the sepulchers of the kings, namely his blood and the blood of his descendants. We find the other rare places where blood appears, the bloods in plural, we understand, because there they talk about not just the person killed, but also the future generations, when it says the bloods of your brother, it's all the generations to come. You can guess what we're going to talk about now. Genesis 6-9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was in his generations a man righteous and wholehearted. Noah walked the God. The rabbis read this and they say, there's something extra here. Why not just say, Noah was in his generation, was a righteous man. Why do they say in his generations? What word is extra? Of course, generations. Breshit Rabbah. In his generations, Rabbi Judah and Rabbi Nehemia differed. Rabbi Judah said only in his generations was he a righteous man. In other words, he was relatively righteous. Had he flourished in the generations of Moses or Samuel, he would not have been called righteous. It is the street of totally blind uh, that they go on and say, in the street of the totally blind, a one-eyed man is called clear-sighted. And the infant is called the scholar. So Noah wasn't that great a guy. That's why they said in his generations. It is as if a man who had a wine vault opened, one barrel, had, had a wine vault opened, one barrel and found a vinegar, another and found a vinegar, a third, however, he found turning sour. So the one that's turning sour is a great find. In, it is turning, people said to him, any better here, he retorted, similarly in his generation. The, then Rabbi Nehemiah said, if he was righteous even in his generation, how much more had he lived in the age of Moses? If he was able to be righteous in a generation of sinners, wow, just think how great a person he would have been if he lived in a generation where everybody was righteous. He might, and then once again, the parable, he might be compared to a tightly closed field of perfume lying in a graveyard. 
which nevertheless gave forth a fragrant odor. How much more than if it was outside the graveyard? Because of course, outside the days, graveyards stank of decaying bodies. So they said, no, in his generation, if he smelled good in a place that stank, wow, in a place that didn't have the stench, the smell would be all that much better. Two readings, one verse, both legitimate, and from both we can learn. Now we get to the parables. Song of Songs, Rabbah, the interpretation of the Song of Songs tells us the meaning and importance of a parable. Rabbah Amarin, again, third century, do not let the parable appear of little worth to you. You say, okay, a parable, it's not the actual text. Eh. Through a parable, a person can fathom words of the Torah. The parable will teach you and help you understand the Torah better. That's what Jesus did. Consider the king who lost the gold coin. Ah, see the drawing to remind you? Just in this case, it's a king. It's not a maid, it's not a poor woman. Or a precious coin, or in the really translation should be a precious stone in his house. May he not find it by the little wick worth no more than an isar. An isar in those days, in the third century, was the smallest of coins, similar to the middle widow's mite, which was the smallest coin in those days. A wick costs nothing, but he finds a precious coin. Likewise, do not let a parable appear of little worth. That candle, that wick lights everything up. By its light, a person may fathom the words of the Torah. In this case, unlike the parable in the New Testament, has also an element of cynicism and a joke, because why would a king get down on his hands and knees searching for a gold coin if he has safes full of them? But all the same, the message comes across. Okay, Eicha Rabbah, Lamentations Rabbah, the book written, said to be written by Jeremiah after the destruction of the temple. Rabbi Levi said, what is this parable to? A man who put wine in his cellar. Now, we're talking about from the more or less from the time of Jesus was written. Just listen, you'll see the exact same types of parables and learnings, and you can say, ha, they're speaking the same language. A man who put wine in his cellar, thieves entered and took the barrels and went away, drank it. The wine owner comes, found those who stole the barrel. He said to them, you drank the wine, bring the barrel back to its place. So what is that like? So from Shechem, from Shechem, Joseph's brother stole him and sold him. And when he passed from the word world, he said, take an oath. He said to them, and this is the story, please my brothers, from Shechem you stole me alive, return my bones to Shechem, as it is said in Joshua, we're told of the story of the returning of the bones and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried them in Shechem, again, getting back to the Samaritans, we're not gonna deal with that now, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought from, bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of the children of Israel. Because why would the owner want the barrels returned if they were empty? Because there's a value even to that. So that's, again, reading into the text and adding on to the story of Joseph being returned. Midrash Halacha, a legal reading into the text. Mechilta the Rabbi Ishmael, again, another source. It says, we're told in the Bible, you shall not cook a kid in its mother's milk. Rabbi Shimon says, why is this written in three places? It's written in Exodus 23, Exodus 34, and Deuteronomy 14. And then, because why, why would the Bible repeat the same thing three times? They said, that they, they correspond to three covenants that the Holy One, blessed be he, forged with Israel. So they say, why three times? Because three times there was a covenant on one in Choreb, Choreb is Mount Sinai. One in Arvot Moab, that's the, the, the plains before Moab. And one on Mount Grizim and Mount Eval, where everybody stood up. Again, we're back to Mount Grizim, where the Samaritans are, where they stood and had 
they, they had the six on each side yelling out the, in a way, the, the, the covenant. Rabbi Yoshiao says, the first stated first, and firsts are not expounded. You're not allowed to eat the first of the animals there to be brought to the te temple. Why is the second stated? A clean animal confers truma, it becomes, that is the uncleanliness by being carried. So that's what you're also forbidden from eating. And an unclean animal confers tuma by being carried. If you touch it, it makes you, that's why it's mentioned, a second to separate you the clean and the unclean, the pure and the unpure. Tuma is impurity. If you have learned about a clean animal that is forbidden to cook in its flesh, in its flesh, in its mother's milk, I might think that the same holds true for an unclean animal. In other words, maybe you can cook an unclean animal in its mother's milk. It is therefore written in the milk of its mother and not in the milk of an unclean animal. The third, in the milk of its mother, but not in human milk, which is a very complicated, strange discussion. But we're talking about trying to understand why, because this law of not cooking a kid in its mother's milk has been interpreted, and for sure in the time of Jesus, we know for a fact, was also Jews will not mix milk and meat. And that's used from the learning of this text. Why does it appear three times? We give a legal interpretation into the source. Abba Hanan says the name of Rabbi Elazar. Why is it written in three places? Let's get a different answer. Because again, and all answers are legitimate. Once for a large beast, once for goats, once for sheep. In other words, the mother, can, you would think maybe cows, it's okay, goats and sheep, it's not. The three basic animals that Jews were permitted to eat were cows, goats, and sheep. So it's each time to let us know that each one of them is forbidden. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar says, why is it written in three places? Once for a large beast, once for a small beast, once for an animal. In other words, other animals that might be permitted. And that a different option is once to forbid eating, once to forbid the derivation of benefit. You can't even profit from it and wants to forbid cooking. You can't eat it, you can't do it, you can't benefit from it. And another option, whether the land of Israel or outside the land of Israel, once before the temple, once before, once not before the temple. And another op explanation is whether it's non-consecrated animal or a consecrated animal. Multiple explanations, all legitimate, all trying to answer a question. Ha, now we're reaching. <laughs> you can see the picture. You can probably guess what it is. Here's a parable, and then we'll see the amazing similarity again, a parable from the time of Jesus. It's quoted in the Babylonian Talmuds, was written in the 5th century, but Rabbi Lazar were dating him to around the time of Jesus. We learned elsewhere, Rabbi Lazar said, repent, re repent one day before your death. His disciples asked him, does then one know on what day he will die? In other words, <laughs> here's your chance. If you, no matter what you did in your life, repent one day before you die, then maybe you'll make it to heaven, which is a, a strange concept, though it's very prominent in many elements of Christianity today. And then he says, then all the more reason that he repents today. In other words, see every day as your last day. He replied, lest he die tomorrow. And thus, his whole life is spent in repentance. So that's the, the idea. In other words, you have to live your whole life as if tomorrow is your last day. The gates of heaven await you, so you have to live a good life your whole life. And Solomon too said in his wisdom, I'm quoting, it says, let thy garments be always white. In other words, interpreting the meaning of let thy garments be always white, you should always be clean. And let not thy head lack ointment. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you put oil on your head. That's actually <laughs> where the term Messiah comes from because it's always be anointed. But anointed to work on. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai 
says, this may be compared to a king who summoned his servants to a banquet without appointing a time. The wise one adorned themselves and sat at the door of the palace, for said they, is anything lacking in a royal palace? The fools went about the work saying, can there be a banquet without preparations? Suddenly the king desired the presence of his servants. The wise entered adorned while the fools entered soiled. The king rejoiced at the wise, but was angry with the fools. Those who adorned themselves for the banquet ordered he let them sit, eat and drink. But those who did not adore themselves for the banquet, let them stand and watch. I would think that sounds a bit similar to Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Again, the banquet, and we talked about the banquet with the element, the banquet of the end of days. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridemaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will be not enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. Interestingly enough, in Jewish law, if there's only enough water in one canteen and two people are in the desert, you keep the canteen for yourself. If you split it, you both die. Similar here. <laughs> you keep the oil for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And again, the banquet at the end of days. Later, the other bridemaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Two very similar parables with the same method, with the same concept of the banquet, the banquet of the end of days. So you can see how the environment, the reading, the textual understanding that Jesus came from. But we're gonna end with a wonderful example of how many of the types of learning and readings we talked about today all come to be with a parable of the wicked tenants. And let's read it first straight out. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, the people in the audience, and the audience replies, he will put those wrenches to a miserable death, death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you not read the scripture? And he quotes and he says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's really not the cornerstone. We'll talk about that in a minute. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone who falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. 
They wanted to arrest him, but feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Now let's try to read into this text. Matthew 23, 21, 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who pointed a vineyard, who planted a vineyard. Let's open up Isaiah chapter 5. What do we read? Now I now will I sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved hath a vineyard in his very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and he gathered out stones thereof, and planted it with a choice vine, and built a tower in the midst of it. We know where Jesus is taking his story from, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought, brought forth wild grapes. Now, when Jesus is telling this story, most of the followers, especially the Pharisees and the priests, know the story. So what he understands already, the wild grapes, in other words, grapes that can't be used to make wine, useless grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Now let's start seeing, understanding some of the elements that we're talking about here and what Jesus has said before and is interpreting and reading into the text itself. We're told, we're told that it's, it's quoted in Pirkei Avot, be deliberate in judgment, raise up many disciples and make a fence for the Torah, the vineyard, God's Torah, God's teachings, make a fence around it, just as Jesus says in Matthew 5, Ye have heard that it was said of them, old time, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, those who is angry, I'm building a fence around the forbidden for killing, without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever say to thy brother, Rasha, evil person, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Build a fence, just like I taught you before. Build a fence, so be it. And dug a wine press. Gethsemane, the press of wine. Was he foreseeing something? And build a watchtower. What is the, how do you understand the watchtower? And we're told in the book of Leviticus, and ye shall keep my statues and do them I am the Lord your God. You shall keep the word for watchtower, shomer, migdal shmira, is the same thing for keeping. You shall protect. You shall build a watchtower. You have the obligation to look over it. And the traditions of the fathers were told, then he leased it to his tenants. And he, we're told here, he leased to his tenants and went to another, another country very similar to what appears in the, in the tradition of the fathers. When the harvest time had come, and in Isaiah 10, we're told, for the vintage will fail, the gathering will not come. When the wine is not collected, the gathering, physical, spiritual, end of days. So Jesus is taking the story that comes from Isaiah and reading and interpreting and giving new meanings to the words. He sent his slaves. In Matthew 22, he, we understand that the word slaves really means messengers. He sent his people just like Abraham sent his eldest servant. The, 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 we're, we're talking about ascending Eliezer, in the Bible, it says avdo, his slave, to the tenant. So keep in mind, we're not talking about an actual slave, but his servants, just as people, our God always relates to his people as his servants. Just a side comment, that is, Abraham was called his friend. That's why the city of Hebron, Haver, God's friend, also in Arabic, interesting enough, Khalil, the friend, but that's a different story. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So 
we just see that as a typical, okay, that's what they did to them. But no, Jesus knows what he's talking about. Because beating, hereg, is one of the types of execution that exists in the Jewish law. Stoning is another type of execution that exists in the Jewish law. And beating, 39 beats, is another punishment. So what they're just saying, already the people listening, the Pharisees and the priests, the Sadducees, here are people who are giving out punishments. It's the courts, it's you people who sit on the courts. And they would immediately understand it. For us, we might not see it in that way. First Kings 19, we read, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel, again, I'm talking about Elijah, saying, have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets. What does prophets have to do with here? Because he sent their messengers. We spoke about in a previous lecture, the term prophet in Hebrew is not somebody who foresees the future. It's somebody who speaks the word of God. You've taken the people who've come that speak the word of God and you have beaten them, you have killed them. He's, again, there's no doubt whatsoever that the people hearing this immediately think of the story of Elijah and Ahab. And he sent other slaves more than the first and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son, is Jesus saying he sent me? Let's see. To them, he talked about the wine press, Gethsemane, Gatshmanim, the press of the wine. He sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him in. He threw him out of the vineyard. What word is strange here? Out of. Why is the text telling us out of? That's just like in previous times. We see a word that's out of place. Why is he thrown out of the vineyard? Because Jesus will be crucified outside of the wall of the city. Because Golgotha, Calvary, has to be outside of the wall. You can't bury somebody inside the wall. He can't be buried in the vineyard. He has to be buried outside of the vineyard. But according to the Christian tradition, he will return to the vineyard. He will receive it, but he has to be taken out. So here we can see the hinting to what will be coming in the future. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Everybody replies, he will put the wretches to the miserable deaths and leave the, lease the vineyard to other tenants and will give the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you not read the scriptures? And here we're going to read into the scriptures, but in some interesting ways. Now, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's not a cornerstone. It's a keystone. And it makes all the difference in the world. So all the churches called Cornerstone Church, including John Hagee, should change to keystone. Because the keystone is the stone that supports the arch, that supports the whole building. The way to bring down the building is to remove the keystone. It's the most center stone in the whole building. This was the Lord doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Now, what's very important is that we have to understand that this psalm that Jesus quoted was this part of the psalms that the Jews today and the Jews in those days would have sung on Passover, on Pentecost, and on the Festival of the Booths. The, the festival of <laughs> the Festival of Booth, where you're bringing in the fruits, you're bringing in the grapes, the festival of the fest of Passover, and the fest of Pentecost. The, the early generation of the first Jewish followers of Jesus would have understood this for sure and linking those three holidays to the story. Unfortunately, today, we miss out on it. Luke tells us in Acts, this is the stone which was set at naught of your builders, 
which it became the head of the coroner. Once again, Luke is taking what Jesus said and interpreting it for his readers, for his followers. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And, it, and once again, falls on the stone. Maybe the same stone Jesus was crucified on. And it will crush anyone whom it falls. When the chiefs and the Pharisees saw that, they realized he was speaking about him. They wanted to arrest him because they regarded him as a prophet. He, but they didn't say it as a prophet foreseeing the future. Matthew 21, we're told, a prophet, he was somebody who was speaking God's word. He was interpreting God's word because a prophet is somebody who takes what God says and helps people understand it. He's using the parables in many of the ways we saw that he's interpreting the Bible. He's reading the Bible in the Jewish way of those days and helping and getting his message across through that. So we'll, okay, we'll, we'll take this page and with this page we will conclude. Because here we have Jewish parables similar to what Jesus said but understanding things in a different way. Rabbacha the Great said, The grass weareth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Quoting Isaiah, What is it like? Like a king who had a beloved friend and suggested to him and said, Come with me and I give you a gift. He went with him and died. The king invites his friend, but his friend dies. The king said, his beloved, to his beloved son's, friend's son, even though your father died, I do not retract my promised gift to your father. Come take it. In other words, the gift, the giving of the Torah and the giving of God's relationship to the Jewish people is passed down from generation to generation. It is not taken away from them. So is the case with the king of the king, the king, the king of kings, because God is frequently known as Melech Malchei Hamelachim, the king who is the king of kings, the Holy One, blessed be him. The blessed, the beloved is Abraham, as it is said, the seed of Abraham, my friend, as we talked about before. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, you come with me. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. That's when God turns to Abraham and says, and again, Lech lecha me'artzecha, mimoladetcha umibet avicha. This is a promise him, a gift, as it is said. Arise, walk through the land. This is the gift he's giving him, the land of Israel or all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Moses, even though I promised my gift to the patriarchs to give them the land and they died, I do not retract my promise, gift rather, but the Lord our, of our God shall stand forever. The gift is an eternal gift. Now you can see, again, Jesus talking about Abraham. Stones can even replace that. The Jewish tradition is it's an eternal gift which goes on forever. Yelkut Shimon, we have Rabbi Isaac, said, should not the Torah have begun with the words, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months? Because that's the first commandment that the children of Israel are given. So why don't we just start with the first commandment? Why start with the words in the beginning? Because, then he quotes Psalms, he revealed to his people his powerful works in giving them the heritage of nations. How do we understand that? For lest the other nations of the world say to the Israelites, you're robbers, you have conquered the lands of seven nations. They can respond 
that the entire earth belongs to the Holy One. Blessed be he. He created it and he gave it to whoever he fell, he has saw fit. Gave it to them or taking it away from them or giving it to us according to his will. God has the final say on who receives things, which is not far from what Jesus said. So hopefully you might be home now. Next year, you will have a chance to visit Jerusalem, to visit the land that God has created, and as I see it today, has agreed to share it with all Jew and Jew Gentile alike. So with that, we will conclude today's lecture, and I hope you enjoyed it. Next week, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take one parable and learn it in depth to understand it, how I think the Jewish reading of the parable would have been and how it was or was wanted to have been understood very, very different than the way it has been read over the years. Thank you very much. Look forward to meeting you all again. Thanks, Joel, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this lecture and would like to see more, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Information on our biblical tours can be found on our website, christian-travel.com, and a link is in the, in the description. That concludes today's lecture. Thank you all again, and stay safe.